morning. Uh, good morning. All right, y'all stand up. Who's done all the Christmas shopping? Who hasn't done any Christmas shopping? I guess it'll happen. Oh, we still have, what, 23 days? 23, yeah, we're good. All right, can everybody do this? We're cool this morning. How about Jeremy back there on the upright? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's my favorite. I love this. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep. down from the sky and stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. As it's Christmas, the angels are singing, and I know the reason the Savior is born.
into the world. It is a wonderful season where we get to celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus. We love you. We thank you for loving us. Father, we thank you that there is no greater story to tell from the mountaintops than the birth of our Lord and our Savior. You came to redeem us. You came to restore us, Father. So we thank you for that. God, everything that is done in this service today, we pray that it exalts you, that it lifts you up. Lord, that you are held high above so people can see. God, that you are the light of the world, that people can see, that people will run to and find shelter in. We thank you, Father, that you want to come hang out with us today. We invite you in this place, and we invite you to just do the work that you've set apart for today especially. We love you. And thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Thank you for being with us this morning. My name is Ashley. I'm the worship leader here. This is Paige, Vincent, Janet. They're all worship leaders. I just get a tie over it. So we're all doing this together. But you know what? You're a worship leader too. You are. To the person beside you, to your family at home, to the person who sees you singing in the car. You know? Maybe roll the window down a little bit if it's not snowing or raining or so they can hear, you know. Let them hear that we are singing about our Lord and our Savior. We're inviting him into our presence at every moment of the day. I can't think of a better thing to share with the world than our Father and his glorious Son. a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth.
may be seated. We're going to continue to worship God. Now, today is Communion Sunday here in our church. And just a couple of things we want to cover real quick. We want you to understand you are welcome here. We have an open table in the United Methodist Church. Everyone can partake in communion. You don't have to be a member of our church. We want you to do that. You may feel unworthy to take communion today, but I want you to know John Wesley felt like if you have to be worthy None of us are worthy for communion based upon what we do. It's based upon what Jesus already did for us 2,000 years ago on that cross of Calvary. Amen. But our altar is going to be open in a moment. If you'd like to come and kneel and pray before you take the bread or the wine, please feel free to do so. And we also have a tradition in our church. That's why the basket is on the table. That is for us to have offerings for the less fortunate. We help people in our church on a weekly basis that come through here that maybe need a little bit of money, they may need a place to stay, they may need some kind of assistance, and your generosity allows us to do that for this community. And Jesus commanded us to do this, that's why we do this now. And if Chuck Nave will come forward, he's going to help me as we uh, do this table of communion. In the Last Supper, before he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave to his disciples. He said, this is my body broken for you. Likewise, he took the cup, he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink this. It represents the covenant of my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins for many. Everyone stand. We'll start on this end and come around.
The drought breaks with the tears of a mother A baby's cry is the sound of love Come down, come down, Emmanuel Oh, He is the song for the suffering He is Messiah, the Prince of anyone here that wants us to bring Holy Communion to you, please just slip your hand up. We'll be happy to bring it back. that sweet time of worship. We're going to continue to worship God now as our ushers come. We're going to return the tithe that belongs to God and lay the, give the offerings that he's laid upon our hearts today. And in, in the book of Luke, in the first chapter, verse 35, the angel's telling Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. And that's another reason that we worship is because God is so good. He gave us Jesus. He gave us the payment for our sin debt. So how much more should we return and worship him by what he has given us, a portion of what he's blessed us with in this earth. So thank you so much for your obedience, and thank you for your faithfulness and your tithes and offerings. Let's pray for our offering. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the season. 
where we have a uh, arrival in our minds. God, we thank you for hope, that this is a day of hope in our salvation and eternal life, being able to spend eternity with you, Jesus, in heaven, in a new heaven and a new earth. Now bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The candle of hope, meditate on these words. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Gracious Father, as the Advent season begins, we cry out to you. Some of us see only darkness this time of year. Some of us find life overwhelming. Some of us are filled with Advent joy. Wherever we find ourselves today, loving Father, be with us on this journey. Our hope is in you alone. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, I, I, I love the Christian calendar because it, it speaks to the reality of the empire of Christ. That there's even another way of telling time. And it begins with Advent. That's, we, we enter back into the telling of the whole story of Jesus. We mark time. This is how big Jesus is to us. We mark time by retelling through the year the story of Jesus and it starts with this anticipation. It doesn't start with December 25th. It starts with the first Sunday in Advent and we begin to anticipate and we, we feel that yearning, that longing that the Hebrew prophets felt. We, we pray their prayers, we read their poems and we, we get that, you know, this the, the Magnificat and, and Zachariah's prayer and, and longing for this one to come that will liberate us. And so uh, we need that four weeks to build this proper anticipation. And then we arrive at Christmas and it's not one day. It's 12 days. It's a 12-day feast because why? Because God has broken into history. The Word has become flesh. God is now with us. He's going to be with us in birth, in life, in sorrow, suffering, pain, and travail, even in death, that we might be with Him in resurrection. And so, Advent is about learning how to hope and to orient our life in the direction of hope, to move in that direction uh, with some patience. And that's, that's how I think about it. You think we need patience in our time? I think we need patience. I think patience is the, is the heart of wisdom. I think about, if you, if you ask me, well, who are the wise people you have known? And I really take time to think about it. I end up thinking that one of their primary characteristics is their patience. That uh, I am most foolish when I am most impatient. And uh, I think the counsel of wisdom is almost always be more patient. Amen. Welcome. Welcome to our new series called Arrival. It will go all the way up through Christmas Eve and the Advent season here. That fellow's preaching to me. Maybe I'm the only one in here that needs to work on my patience. Amen. There's some others being pointed to in the back. I won't name any names. One of them I'm closely related to, however. There is a new, uh, we have a lot to be thankful for here in our church. Our church is now paid off. We've got Mary Patterson that's going to be featured on the Hallmark Channel. The time has changed on that. It's not 8 o'clock. I think it's 6 o'clock, somebody told me. So she's going to be on there. It's coming up, I think, this next week. So set your DVRs, look in your bulletins. I know there's more information 
in the bulletins and in our newsletter that goes out. And we're all running around, we're traveling, we're doing all kinds of shopping, we're getting ready for Christmas, getting ready for the holidays. And that reminds me of a story that I heard about recently about a man who was traveling, and he happened to be a priest. And a very distinguished lady was on a plane arriving from Switzerland, and she found herself seated next to a nice Catholic priest whom she asked, Excuse me, Father, could I ask a favor? Of course, my child, what can I do for you? He says, Here's the problem. I bought myself a new sophisticated hair remover gadget for which I paid an enormous sum of money. I have really gone over the declaration limits, and I am worried that they will confiscate it at customs. Do you think you could hide it under your cassock? Of course I could, my child, but you must realize I cannot lie. You have such an honest face, Father. I am sure they will not ask you any questions. And she gave him the hair remover, and he placed it beneath his robe just below his sash. The aircraft arrived at its destination. When the priest presented himself to customs, he was asked, Father, do you have anything to declare? From the top of my head to my sash, I have nothing to declare, my son, he replied. Finding this reply strange, the customs officer asked, And from the sash down, what do you have? The priest replied, I have there a marvelous little instrument designed for the use by women, but which has never been used. Breaking out in laughter, the customs officer said, Go ahead, Father, next. Well, he didn't lie. He, he told her he wouldn't lie. So, Oh, enough of that foolishness. Let's go. What is the definition? What is the definition of Advent? Some of you will get that on the way home later today. So explain that to each other. What is the definition of Advent? Advent is the arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. And that's why I named this series Arrival. I can't think of a more notable person than we have to look forward to than the time that we celebrate Jesus Christ and his arrival on this earth in the form of a baby in a manger coming into, into earth, coming out of heaven, stepping down, lowering himself where he was co-equal to God to come for me and to come for you in order to pay our sin debts. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, it can be wiped clean today. Amen. And that is the good news of the gospel. And this being the first Sunday of Advent, we lit the hope Candle. We thank the Swafford family for doing that. We'll have someone doing that each Sunday, and we've simplified it for you. Michael Rose did some good videos for us, so you don't have to say a word. You just come up, light the candles, and we look forward to that, and we count each week down until we get to the Christ candle there on Christmas Eve. So what is hope? We're, we're celebrating hope today, and hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. It could be a feeling of trust, the archaic. If we have hope, in salvation, we have trust in Jesus Christ. That's our hope of eternal life. So what do you hope for today? Where do you place your trust? What does the Bible teach us about hope and trust? And let's dig into that today. Let's look and see Lamentations. I've got a typo there. We've got chapter 3, 21 through 24. It's actually 22 through 24. My apologies for that. But you can uh, correct that if, you, if that bothers you. If not, just follow along. The scriptures will be correct in here. So let's look at Lamentations 3 in the New Living Translation. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. And that's good news. It's good news that he is so faithful. His love never ends. His mercies are new each morning. No matter what mistakes we may have made yesterday, no matter what we did this morning when we got up, no matter how we feel, it really doesn't matter how we feel. It's based upon what he did, not what we do. And that's the great news because none of us can make the mark. None of us can go sin free in this life. And your first point today, our hope as Christians is in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where our hope has to be. If you don't have that kind of hope, then you're not going to have peace. You're not going to have love. You're not going to have joy. You're not going to have the other things that we need to have in life to be able to live to the fullest that we could possibly live in these earth suits. We trust him for our salvation. We trust him for our eternity. We all face the day when we take our last breath. I've got a really tough service that I've got to go to immediately following this service. I've got to run. I've got to drive to Knoxville. And there was a young lady that's been attending our church who lost her baby on Thanksgiving morning. She was born, and she was not alive. And it's such a terrible thing. And I've got to go and try to offer her hope and try to offer her the chance of seeing her daughter again someday. And that's what we all do when we go to the graveside, when we lay a loved one to rest. We need that hope 
of that reunion, that we're not saying goodbye, but we're saying we'll see you soon. And without that hope, it's a miserable, miserable funeral. It's a miserable graveside service when you go there and you don't have that hope of eternity and you can't share that and give them that kind of peace for the family in mourning. Let's see what the prophet Isaiah says about light and about being light in the darkness. It's what we should all strive to do as Christians is let our light shine. You may remember some of those songs if you grew up in Sunday school, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You guys will be singing that the rest of the day in your mind. You're welcome. Isaiah 60, verse 1 through 3. Arise, Jerusalem, and shine like the sun. The glory of the Lord is shining on you. Other nations will be covered by darkness, but on you the light of the Lord will shine. The brightness of his presence will be with you. Nations will be drawn to your light, and kings to the dawning of your new day. So my question to you today is your second point. Who are you drawing to the light with your hope? Who are you influencing for the kingdom? And I know many of us probably won't stand up and, and preach for 30 minutes with a sermon. We probably won't have to lead worship up here singing on the stage. But there are ways that you can reach others. You should have light shining in you daily. No matter where you are, if you're in the hospital as a physician or a nurse or if you're in an accountant's office or if you're a clerk at a register or if you're a salesperson, whatever you may be doing, we should carry that hope. We should carry that light of Jesus Christ with us wherever we go. And I want to ask you this question, too. Think about this. Say, what would those people at work say about me? And I'll use my name. So what, what are people saying that work with me? What are they saying about David? They say, man, he is just so positive. He's so full of, of joy. He's so full of hope. He's so full of positive thoughts and positive actions. Or would they say, man, why is he so down all the time? Why is he so negative? Why is he so rude? Why is he impatient? Like the transition video said today. I guess we all have moments. I mean, we all have good times and we all have bad times. I'm not trying to say that we will never be rude, we'll never be impatient, we'll never say the wrong thing to somebody at the wrong time. But we should be more often than not living for Christ. We should have that hope. We should have that light that shines out into the darkness that we can reach others. God wants us to be a witness. Not only did Jesus command us to take the communion, to take the Lord's Supper, but he also commanded us to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you may never travel to Africa. You may never travel to the Czech Republic. But you're traveling throughout your day here in Sevierville or wherever you may be from that you're going to return to, that you have that opportunity to be the witness for Jesus Christ. Again, Isaiah, let's look at chapter 11, verse 10. In that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. That is going to be an incredible time. When Jesus comes back and he actually sets his throne up in Jerusalem, and he is going to have the nations coming to him. We're going to be a part of that. We're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ as Christians. And we're going to restore, or he's going to restore the world using us in some capacity to what this world was supposed to be. When Adam and Eve walked with God in the Garden of Eden, when they had that kind of close relationship and that ability to be in each other's presence. We're still looking forward to that day. We're not there yet, but that's going to be a fantastic day for us. As Christians, and the, the banner that we should be carrying around is the cross. We should be carrying around the gospel, the good news that we share with others. Because we want everybody that can be there to join us in that glorious day when the, when the world is restored to what it's supposed to be. The Israelites had many battles. They had many enemies, and Amalek was one of their enemies that they were defeating. At one time, there's a great story about Moses in Exodus where he's holding up his staff, and as long as he held the staff up, they were victorious. Well, his arms would get tired, and then he had two men come beside him and help hold the staff up, and they defeated all the Am Amalekites. And Exodus 17, 15 says, And Moses built an altar, and he called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. God won the battle. Jehovah Nisi means the Lord is my banner. And God had fought for them, and, and Moses wanted to have an altar there, and he wanted them to remember. It was their form of a banner that they put up to remind everybody about how God was faithful, about how he defeated their enemies. Anybody ever seen any banners? Do you ever go to any sporting events? If you've been to Thompson Bowling Arena, you've seen the Lady Vols. They've got a lot of banners hanging up there, right? The men, not as many. 
And then UT football, do we, do we even have a football team anymore? I mean, y'all, it hurts. I, I was this tall when I first started following UT Vols football. Maybe one of these days we'll, we'll get back up there and have another good football team. But we hang banners to recognize things, to remember great teams, the great moments, things that have happened. I know that, uh, that we've seen those. But what are two things about banners I want you to know about? Banners are raised to celebrate and to honor. They hang from rafters honoring champions. They honor soldiers returning from war in parades. They adorn public places, celebrate occasions uh, of people that deserve honor. They hang in our traditional sanctuary. If you go over there, you'll see them in front of the pulpit. You see them hanging on the side of the wall to recognize the different seasons in the church calendar and what's going on. Towns all over America raise banners on certain holidays to commemorate something dear to them. A patron, a product, a hero or tradition, a holy day. Banners are labels and signets. They announce names and images that people can recognize from a great distance. If you see advertising, you can see a banner, a shape, and they do that on purpose so that you recognize their product. They show the location and identity of businesses and events so that people can navigate to it. If you go to Walmart and you look up, you can see the different places or the different grocery stores. They have the labels, and those are sort of banners to guide you where you need to go. The second point I want you to know about banners, they're visible. So we need to be visible as Christians. People should not guess, okay, is David a Christian? Does David follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? They shouldn't have to guess that about me, and I shouldn't have to go around telling people. I mean, it's okay to share. But if I'm having to tell somebody that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, it might be better that they can see through my life an example that I am following Jesus Christ. But the whole point of a banner is to be seen unmistakable, unignorable. Banners are for those who raise them. They are an act of celebration, remembrance, or announcement. They're for those that can see them. They're an invitation, a gathering place. They summon and they call. They attract passers-by. As you consider all this about banners, talking about a carnal definition, can you see how God is the banner, how God is our banner, how Jehovah Nissi is who we represent, and we should be carrying that banner of the cross everywhere that we go in every opportunity. Inviting people to church. Summon them. Attract them. Be Jesus to them. Let them know what a good thing it is that we have the good news of the gospel. We've got to raise Jesus. We've got to keep him on that banner and summon everyone to him. He was raised up on that cross for the whole world. For whosoever should believe in him should not perish. But he gives you the choice. Do you have a banner of hope visible for the world to see? Let's see what the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 15, 12 through 13. And in another place, Isaiah said, The heir to David's throne will come, and he will rule over the Gentiles. They will place their hope on him. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace, because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Third point today, it's another question. What do you overflow with today? Is it good? Is it more often good than bad? I know we all have our moments. We all have down times. We all get things that happen in life because life does happen. Amen. It can be tough. But do you overflow with confident hope for the most part? Do you have that kind of power, the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us? Romans tells us at that moment of salvation, God is with us and dwells us. Where do you go? Where do you go to grow in that overflow? How do, you, how do you build that up? Sometimes I'll step away from my notes and I'm preaching things that aren't in my notes that I didn't even plan to say before I got here today. And that's the Holy Spirit bringing something out of me to speak, to teach to you all. And if I didn't spend time with God, I wouldn't have any kind of overflow to share. If I'm not in the Word of God, renewing my mind and learning what he tells me in these 66 books of the Bible and not trying to live by it and apply it to my life, I wouldn't have anything to share with you. I could get up and tell some corny jokes and some interesting stories and read a poem and we could say a prayer and we could go home. And it's always good. Don't get me wrong. Even if you've not picked up the Bible, yes, pick it up. Go to it. Try to find those things that are going to be able to help bless and encourage others. But if I didn't spend time in the Word of God on a daily basis, if I didn't sharpen my sword, I would have nothing to give to anybody who comes to my office because people come to my office and the marriage is falling apart. The addiction is real. The financial problems or whatever it may be, I've got to have something to share to them. I've got to have something to build them up and encourage them. And not out of my opinion, but what comes out of the Word of the living God. 
And if I don't have that, I'm not going to be able to help them. I mean, it would be really bad if you came to my office with a tragedy and I told you, well, I'm not sure about that. If you could come back next week, I'm going to research this and try to find something that could help you. Now, you might do that. It might be something that I've never heard of before. But more often than not, everything is going to apply from right here. And if I can find something in the Word of God to give you that you can take back with you that can help you, then that's part of my job as being a pastor to encourage and edify others, to build up people. Whether it's 100 people sitting in the sanctuary or one person in my office, that's what I feel like I'm called to do. And you may not have an opportunity to stand up in front of 100 people and share the gospel, but who this next week are you going to be able to interact with that you can share that peace, that joy, that hope, the love of Jesus Christ with? The world needs your overflow, folks. I don't know if you've looked around, if you've listened to the news, if you've seen what's going on around in this old, nasty, dark world. The world needs you, and they need that hope. Not just the clergy. It's not just the pastors and the preachers and the teachers. But you know what? If you call yourself a Christian today, and I pray that everyone in here today in the sanctuary has surrendered to Jesus Christ, you are a minister of the gospel. You are. Let's look and see. What scripture tells us, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth in chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us, and no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. And I know he's specifically talking about him and others like him who are sharing the gospel, who are traveling the world. But put yourself in there. In everything you do, do you show that you're a true follower, a true disciple of God, that you are a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ? We need to be. We need to be sharing that hope in all that we do. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6. We are confident of all this because of our great trust in God through Christ. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. This is a covenant not written of written laws, but of the Spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. And that's the good news. We are not under the law because the law is something of rules and regulations that we can't keep. We end up breaking them. We end up doing things that we know we shouldn't do. And Jesus told us even thinking the things that we shouldn't think can lead to that sin and be guilty of the same sin that they said was wrong in the Ten Commandments. So Jesus even raised the bar. So none of us are going to be righteous on our own, none by what we can do in ourselves. But we can be holy as God is holy. We can live based upon what the Holy Spirit speaks through our hearts and what the Word teaches us and what we learn in church, what we learn in fellowship, how we go to Sunday school classes, how we go to small groups, how we don't walk alone. That's why it's so vital for you to be in church that's so vital for you to be plugged in, to be connected with other brothers and sisters in Christ, and then reaching out to others to come in because you will learn so much by trying to teach someone else. You learn more when you get into the Word of God and you try to share it with somebody that doesn't know anything. So you are able to minister hope to others, and that is great news. And in closing today, we're going to wrap this up as our band comes, our musicians get prepared for our closing song. Peter tells us that we are vital to the kingdom of God as priests. In 1 Peter 2, our last verses today, verses 4 and 5, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. You are a minister. It's your fourth point today. You are a priest. You are the church. We have a wonderful building. It's paid for. It's nice. We love it. It's warm in the wintertime, and it's cool in the summertime. Amen. And we just get to come in here, and we get to worship God. We get to eat. We fellowship. We share meals. We reach out to the community. But this building is not the church. We are the church. Look at your neighbor and say, you are the church. And then look back at your neighbor and say, you are the church. We are the church, and if we don't do it, Christ is the head. We're the hands. We're the feet. We're the body. You may think, well, Pastor David, I can't do anything important. Sure you can. Every part of the body is vital. You are needed. Whatever your gift, your talent, or ability is, God can use you to reach somebody for his kingdom. So you are a minister. You're a priest. 
You are the church. Take that this week. That's your challenge. Go to this lost and dying world. Go to this community. Go to where you return to if you're not from here, wherever it may be. Be light in the darkness. Be that hope that you can share with others that don't know Jesus Christ. So what are you hearing? What's the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart today? I don't ever like to close a service without giving you an opportunity to make a decision. I want you to just close your eyes, bow your heads, get quiet. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? Prayerfully, you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Have you been a little bit hopeless lately? Has this stirred your spirit to think, why am I not full of this hope? Why am I not having the joy and the peace, the patience, the love, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the self-control, the fruit of the Spirit? Christian, what, what decision do you need to make today? Maybe it's, I'm going to spend more time in the Word of God. I'm going to work on my overflow. I'm going to make a commitment to church. I'm going to make it a priority. Where I can plug in, where I can connect, where I can sharpen my sword and I could be more effective for the kingdom of God. But maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor David, I really don't know a lot about church. I'm not really a church-going person. David, I don't really know if I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you prayed a prayer, maybe you got baptized at one point in time. But you know, I'm not living for Christ. Today could be your day of salvation. You could pray a prayer like this. If that's you, you've got the doorknob on the inside of your heart. God is a gentleman. He'll never force his way in. All you have to do is open the door and invite him in. Say a prayer like this. Say, Father God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. And God, I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. From this day forward, I'm going to serve you, Jesus. Be my Lord and my Savior. If you pray a prayer like that today, the next thing is important is that you share that with somebody, that you profess that. And we're going to stand right now. We're going to worship God as we sing a closing song of a few verses. I'd be honored to pray with you today. If you made that decision, come on down. Just take me by the hand. I'll pray with you. I'll give you a Bible. I'll encourage you. If you need prayer for anything else, I know we've had some burdens in this church over the past few weeks. If anybody needs any prayer, don't leave today without allowing me to pray for you. God bless you as we worship. When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled How he healed me to the uttermost When I think about the Lord How he picked me up and turned me around How he placed my feet on solid ground Oh, when I think about the Lord how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid He 
God, I just come to you right now, and I thank you for these people. I thank you for your church. God, let us go forth throughout this week. Let us be the church. Let us be hope to a world that needs hope so badly. God, I pray that we'll be light shining in the darkness. God, I pray that you take every burden, everything that came to this altar, God, the spoken and the unspoken, that everyone in this congregation, God, would feel your touch and your love. And God, go before us and help us just to share that touch and that love with everyone that we encounter in the hours, the days, and the weeks ahead. We thank you in advance for what you do in your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.